Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so excited to welcome you all to another Explorer Classroom. We know that folks are continuing to see a lot of really difficult news around the country. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone of every identity and experience should be able to safely explore the wonder of our world. We stand in support of human dignity, respect, and justice. And our Explorer Classroom events are designed to connect students from all around the world with our amazing National Geographic Explorers. They're scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, and so much more. And Explorer Classroom brings us all together for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom on school days at 2 p.m. Eastern time in addition to our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow. But for today, we're very lucky to have Bill McQuay and his collaborator, Laurel Symes, joining us. They specialize in sound-based storytelling, and they especially love to use sound to tell the stories of scientific exploration and of natural history. Today, we're gonna practice our listening, and we're gonna hear from the experts just how much you can learn from the world by listening carefully and asking smart questions. But before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge that we are joined on screen by a bunch of wonderful student groups, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more of you registered to participate along on YouTube today. Welcome. Our students are representing Canada, India, Kuwait, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, Romania, the United Kingdom, Arizona, California, the District of Columbia, Florida, Iowa, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, Minnesota, Missouri, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and probably more places too. I have just a few special shout outs to give today. We've got Azim and Zaneeb, Andrew, Elise and Sophie, Emma B, Hadley, the Hantum family, Hollis Upper Elementary, Jay, Katya, Lucas, Mrs. Kimball's class, Ms. Ricardo's grade four, five, uh, Sacha, Sarah, Shredoot, the St. Vincent de Paul School, the Joy, Miller, and Takahashi families, Toluca Lake Elementary and Tiger in August. It's so lovely to have you all joining us today. And if I missed your state, your country, your school, whatever it may be, please say hello in the YouTube chat sidebar. You can introduce yourself. We'd love to say hi and give you a shout out. But for now, that is plenty of introduction from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Bill and Laurel for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you can join us today in the National Geographic Classroom Experience on Storytelling with Sound, my favorite thing. Now, my name, as you can see, is Bill McQuay. I'm a National Geographic Explorer, and I've been telling stories with sound for more than 30 years. Uh, I especially like to tell stories that involve science and natural history, and by that, I mean I like to tell stories about how amazing the world actually is. As part of my storytelling, I often get to work with scientists whose research includes the sounds that animals make, and joining me today is my good friend, Dr. Laurel Symes. Laurel is the assistant director of the Cornell Center for Conservation Bioacoustics. Uh, Laurel and I have worked together on stories uh, more than 10 years, and she'll be joining us later to talk about one of her many specialties, and that is insect communication. Okay, let's get started. Now I'm gonna play a sound, and it lasts for about 20 seconds. I want you to listen very closely because I'm going to ask you two questions about it. If you've got headphones, I suggest you put them on. If not, just put your ear close to your computer. Here we go. So, first question, did that sound make anyone feel differently than they were, say, a moment ago? Let's find out. Maybe William and Lily could give us an answer. William and Lily, how did that sound make you guys feel? Uh, it made me feel more comfortable. Ah. 
whoops, more comfortable. Well, it's interesting you say that because to tell you the truth, where that sound was recorded, it was pretty uncomfortable because it was recorded oh, oh, there at the North Pole. Now, what makes telling stories with sound so effective? <clears throat> uh, human beings, you, me, a mom and dad or friends, what? I don't know why this jumping head, have evolved to have very sensitive hearing, okay? So one thing, our ears never sleep. Think about that. When you're asleep, uh, there's a sound, you'll wake up. Your eyes may not be watching anything, but your ears are always listening. And this is something that we ev that helped us survive when we were living long time ago, when we were threatened by large animals. You may not be able to see that big hungry animal sneaking up behind you at night, but you could hear it and you could run quickly away. And unlike our eyes, we can hear things that are behind us, above us, below us, to our left and to our right, without even turning our heads. Think about that. You are constantly listening in 360 degrees. The ear never sleeps and it's listening to everything around you. And because we're hearing everything around us, hearing is a sense that connects us most directly to our environment, our world. It makes it possible to tell stories with sound that can take people to different places and time. And because sound has such a powerful effect on how we feel, it's a great way to communicate to others at a very deep level. Okay. As you can hear, the world is full of sound. My most favorite assignment when I was working at National Public Radio was working on a series that was called Radio Expeditions. The series was actually a partnership between National Geographic and NPR. And if you look at the map there, uh, you'll get an idea of how many places we traveled to to tell stories. Now, here's just this handful of photos of me at various locations around the world that I was sent to help tell stories about the natural world and the people that occupy it. Now, specifically, whoa, specifically, these are some of the places and the stories that I worked on. I've been to Tibet, the Arctic, India, various places in the United States, Indonesia, Nepal, Central African Republic, and most recently, Panama. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, I want to play you some short segments from uh, three of the stories from three of these locations, Nepal, Central African Republic, and Panama. And we're going to start here in Nepal with the Rhino Roundup. Now, there's an area in the country in Nepal that's known as the Terai. It's mostly jungle, and it's got rhinoceros and tigers and elephants and other wild animals in it. Now, for centuries, there were a few people that lived there in the Terai together with the animals. But as more and more people arrived, they began crowding out the wild animals and unfortunately destroying their habitat. So to help save the rhino, the World Wildlife Fund started moving the rhinos out of the area and transporting them to another area of the country where they would be safer and there were fewer people. Now, I was on assignment to help this reporter, John Nielsen, tell the story of how this rhino roundup worked. So my job was to record the sounds that would help support the story that he was trying to tell. Now, if you listen closely near the end, you're going to hear something that just demonstrate that things don't always work out the way you plan. It's before dawn now, and a line of Asian elephants is carrying at least 40 people towards a shallow river and a forest shrouded in fog. 
We're moving into the forest now. Elephant has got up a little trot. And I have a death grip on the rope in front of me. The idea now is for the 15 elephants in this group to surround the rhino, gradually collapse the circle, and then the shooters hit the rhino with a dart containing M99. It's a little bit like morphine. The elephants move through the forest in a horizontal line. Hunting formation, I'm thinking. There's a rhino, 20 yards ahead. A thousand pounds, at least, with skin that looks like armor plating and a head that belongs on a dinosaur. It's looking right at me. The elephants circle the rhino. The rhino looks around for a break in the line. It's nice to be on the only animal in the world that's capable of facing down an angry rhinoceros. Okay, the elephant with the shooter is moving in. Everybody's staying back. They're gonna shoot it right here. Listen for the pop. Got him. Uh oh. They're running away. They're taking off. They're trying to catch up to it. And get it into the field. <laughs> now, I hope you were able to understand what was going on there. The elephants circled the rhino. The idea is that the elephant is so big, the rhino, once it's darted and before it falls asleep, it will be too afraid to go anywhere. It'll just lie down and fall asleep. Well, that didn't happen at all. The rhino charged the elephant and all the elephants decided we better get out of here. And they ran in all directions. And that was the chaos that you heard. We did find the rhino several hours later. It was asleep down in the, uh, you can see him down here in the, in the bottom. You can, he was asleep in the grasses and they loaded him up in a big truck and they took him 12 hours away to another location where he's st still there today. The next story I'm going to tell is about uh, listening to elephants. And this took place in the Central African Republic. Now, there's a species of elephants. Most of us think about the elephants as, the, as living in the plains of the, Af uh, of, of the plains in, uh, in, in Africa. But there is a special species of elephant that lives in the forest. They're a little smaller than those, elephant, those other elephants. Now, within the jungle where these elephants live, there's a big clearing. It's known as the Bai. And there, hundreds of elephants get together to play. They bathe. They find mates. They have a pretty good time. Now, as you'll hear, I was so captivated by the sounds of the elephant, I didn't notice that a big bull elephant got very upset that I was in his forest. And he told me so in no uncertain terms. So you're gonna hear that. Now reporting with me is my good old friend and NPR colleague, Chris Joyce. In 2002, I went to the Central African Republic to visit Katie Payne a biologist who created the Elephant Listening Project. I was there to record these elephants for NPR's Radio Expeditions program. Katie's team was living in shacks in a dense jungle inhabited by hundreds of rare forest elephants. And as I recall, Bill, you got an earful of elephant right off the bat. Yeah. I was walking through this rainforest to an observation platform built up in a tree, out of reach of the elephants. I climbed onto a platform with my gear, and I set up my recording equipment. I put my headphones on and then sat there listening. That first roar sounded close to me, but I was so focused on the settings of my recorder that I didn't bother to look around. Truth is, Bill goes into a kind of trance when he records. That second roar sounded a lot closer. I thought, this is so cool. But what I didn't realize was 
there was this huge bull elephant standing right underneath me, pointing his trunk up at me just a few feet away. Apparently, he was making a dominance display. Well, maybe he didn't like being ignored. I was so busy listening, I never looked up. I never saw him. The scientists on the other platform saw the whole thing. Those scientists were part of a listening culture that's evolved over the past 60 years. Honestly, I had no clue that that elephant was just a few feet away from me as I was up in this tree on the platform. I was just so focused on the sound uh, that I had no idea. I only heard about it much later. Okay. Whoops. Now, <clears throat> I'm currently working on a new story, and it's going to be a National Geographic podcast about insects and the threats they face. Uh, the, four, the story features an insect called a katydid, which Laurel's going to talk much more about. And uh, I just finished the first episode of the podcast, and I would like to play just a small part of it for you. Now, Here's your chance to do what I have to do when I'm beginning to work on a story. I need to listen to all the sounds that I've gathered to decide which ones to use that are going to best help me tell the story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play for you just the sounds. I'm not going to include the narration yet. I will do that next. Now I'm just going to listen, play the sounds. And I want you, as you're listening, to try to identify as many of the sounds that you can hear as you listen. Here we go. Or we will in just a moment. Uh-oh. Oh, good. Oh! Let me do this again. Hey, folks. <laughs> That's all right, Bill. It wouldn't be a live event without a little. <laughs> Still easier and smoother than regular Zoom school. We, we love it. Okay, so back. Here we go. I'm going to play just the sounds, and I want you to, to identify as many as you can when you hear them. And I'm going to help you because I will put the names up on the screen as we go through this listening to the sound. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm going to play the same sounds in the same sequence, but I'm going to add my narration. Now, see if you can hear how the narration helps make sense of the sounds and how the sounds help bring the story directly to you as if you're there with us. It's been more than a decade now, and Laurel continues to listen and study insects. And now her research has her exploring insects on a remote tropical island. Laurel and her colleagues are here studying a type of insect that's been singing a song that is believed to be the oldest documented song to date. This is the song of a 165 million year old winged insect called a katydid. 
Scientists know that katydids make sound by rubbing their wings together. So, by using the wings of that fossilized katydid, they were able to recreate that song that dinosaurs would have heard as they roamed the primeval forest at night. It is an oldie, but is it still a goodie? Do male katydids sing the same song today? And if they have changed their tune, how has it changed? And if so, why? So, that's just a little bit of a much longer podcast that is going to be, that is episode one of a four-part series about insects and the threats that they're being, that they're facing. Now, I thought it would be fun to have Laurel talk about what she has discovered about Katie Diz in the research and how she and other scientists are using sound in their research. So, Laurel? Hi. My name is Dr. Laurel Sines, and I've been working with Bill for almost 10 years now, but I am a researcher studying insects, and a lot of the insects I study are in the tropics. So if you go ahead and hit play on this one, Bill, this is a video of a rainforest in Central America. So these are the type of places that my team and I go to study and collect data. And so you can imagine how hard it is to know what lives in these forests. So we use lots of different tools. And one of the tools that we use is sound because you can listen and hear what's living in the forest. And one of the, one of the big things that produces sound is insects. Next. So next. Uh, these are the kind of insects that we study. So they can be really big. So if you look down in the bottom left-hand corner, um, that's the biggest species that we catch and the smallest species that we catch. And those are sitting on my arm. So you can imagine how big those bugs get. And so if you're a monkey or a bat or something like that, if you catch one of those, it's a really good meal. And a lot of katydids um, are successful because they can avoid being eaten by predators. So the, a lot of them look like leaves or sticks or bark. So if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, that's a katydid that looks like a dead leaf. And so you can see its head and antenna on the right and its legs. That's not a leaf, it's an insect, but it's doing a really good job of looking like a leaf. Uh, the one in the middle is maybe looking more like bark or lichen. Um, and you can see that if you look at its back legs, it has little spines that stick off. So if you're a predator and you do try to grab it, it will kick with those spines to try to protect itself. Next. So insects are really important in all sorts of places. So you've probably heard about bees pollinating plants, but insects do lots of other things too. So they, um, one of the major things that they do is eat plants. So if we didn't have insects, there would be a lot more plants and different types of plants, but because um, insects often eat their body weight in leaves every day, they can really change what plants are growing out there. Next. Next. So if you go out in your backyard and you look at leaves, you'll probably see some holes like this. This is examples of insects eating plants. And so that happens all over the world. Next. But lots of things eat insects too. So if you watch birds, a lot of times you'll see that they're maybe flying out and grabbing something and coming back, or they're looking on the ground. Lots and lots of um, birds eat insects. And in tropical rainforests, monkeys eat insects, spiders do, lizards, bats, frogs. And so in the bottom left corner, there's a picture of a bat eating a katydid. But the picture next to it, there's all these little pieces and parts that's what we picked up under a place where bats live. And so the bats will go out and catch insects and they come back and they eat them and they drop the pieces. And so insects are important because they're eating plants and because they're being eaten by lots of other things too. Next. But insects aren't defenseless. So these are some of my favorite ways that they protect themselves against predators. So if you look closely at this insect on the left-hand side, it has these pink legs. Have you ever seen an insect with pink legs before? This is super cool. Um, a lot of animals can't see red very well. 
And so we look at this and we see a green insect with pink legs, but predators look at it and they just see a floating green leaf and they don't realize it's actually an insect that's standing on a branch. And you can sort of see that in the bottom picture. Now that same, same kind of insect is sitting on a branch, but its legs are almost invisible when they're on um, a, a stick. Next. This is another kind of insect. And this one's super cool because it actually walks in a way that helps it um, avoid being obvious to predators. So if you're ever like watching a movie or looking outside, if you see something move, it catches our attention. And so insects have the same problem. If they try to walk down the stem, predators will notice that there's a leaf moving. But when this insect walks, it rocks forward and back. So it will take a few steps forward and a step back and a few steps forward. And so it just sort of looks like it's blowing in the wind, but before you know it, it's walked all the way down the branch. <laughs> and then during the daytime, that funny little point on its head, it will bend down and put that against the stick and put its, the leaf, the, its wings up in the air. And so it looks just like another leaf. And it even has the little brown spots on the wings. So there's nothing wrong with the insect. They were born that way, um, but it helps it look just like the other leaves. Next. And so I mentioned before that we're trying to use sound to understand what insects are in the forest because a lot of them are really good at hiding. And so it's hard to see them, but if we know what sounds they make, then we know what insects are living there. And this is really useful because each species of insect in this forest makes a different sound. So if you click on the microphone in the left-hand side, this is the sound of a, an insect called a Chloroscurtis discus circus. It's just a green insect. And what we did is record the sound and then Bill took it and he slowed it down. And so now we can hear the different parts of that sound. If we were just standing out in the forest, we just hear very quickly, but the insects can hear all of those differences. If you want to click on the next one, this is a, an insect called a Eubliastes. It has another very you know, unique sound. Next. Um, the one on the... So does anybody know why they're making sound? Looks like Sahar it, has an idea. Why don't we okay. see Sahar's idea? Yeah. Go for it. Um, are they talking to each other? Like, they are. Like, like the folk, like the like the um fungus internet. I don't know about the fungus internet, but you're absolutely right. They're talking to each other. Um, so what you're hearing is male insects or the boys who are saying, I'm here, come find me. And so at night, it's all the different individuals saying, you know, I'm here, come over here. Um, and so it's how they find each other. Um, if you wanna click on the microphone on the, the Midiata. So this is the one that we saw with the pink legs before. So they all make different sounds, but by understanding what sound they make, we can understand what insect was there. And I've actually been working with um, colleagues who are computer programmers to be able to use a computer to try to find these sounds in recordings to understand what insects are in the forest. Next. But how do we get these recordings? So a lot of the insects live way up in trees. So you have to go where the insects are at. And so to do that, we actually climb trees. And so you take an eight foot long slingshot and you shoot a little weight up over a branch and then you pull up a rope and then you can climb that rope and put a recorder way up there in a tree. And when you listen to the sounds, you get something really neat. So the sound that Bill is about to play is something that he helped us make for a story that he did. So the first thing you'll hear is the rainforest and then it's going to slow down so that you can hear all the high pitched sounds that were hard for us to hear before. So it will be slower and lower. Oops, sorry. There we go. 
This is just the forest at night. You can hear all the insects and in activity. And now it's slowing down. That's an insect. And that's a bat. So now we can hear all the different things in the forest. So at this point, I just want to thank you so much for your attention and interest um, in insects. I can talk about insects all day long, but I'm going to turn it back to Bill. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Laurel. I mean, I, I was not an insect person until I ran into Laurel. And over time, she convinced me that they are absolutely amazing. And in fact, if it so weren't cool. for, <laughs> and, if, and if it weren't for insects, the, we would not have the earth that we have. It, they, they affect every aspect of our life. And of course, when I finish my podcast, I'm going to tell you all about that. Anyway, <laughs> let me exit this so we can get to the questions. Well, Bill and Laurel, that was amazing. Thank you so much for spending some time and sharing with us today that noise of the forest slow down is like haunting and beautiful. And I don't think I'm amazing. going to forget that anytime soon. Um, for folks following along with us at home, we would love to see what you do with this. Um, maybe you're going to do a follow-up activity from the family guide, draw a picture, write a story. Maybe you're going to even head out into nature and start recording your own sounds or making your own podcast, whatever it is, we would love to see it or hear it. I suppose, um, you can send it to us on Twitter by tagging at Nat Geo education and using hashtag explore classroom. That way we can make sure Bill and Laurel get the chance to see and hear all of your wonderful work too. And now in terms of questions, if you're up on screen with me, get yourself ready with a nice loud voice. If you're watching along on YouTube, uh, go ahead and start leaving your questions in the chat bar. We've seen a bunch of them come through so far. They're looking great. Please only send each question one time. We record everything that you guys send us. So please don't spam us. We'll have to put you in timeout. It'll be sad. But anyway, our very first question for today comes to us from Luigi G who way back at the beginning was wondering about that cold weather sound that you played for us. Did you put the microphone in the snow in order to get that kind of rustling wind mm. noise? How did mm -hmm. that work? So actually that's actually, what a good ear. First of all, that they know that's a cold windy sound. Let's let you know that they're listening. What I actually did was I took my microphone. I didn't put it in the snow, but I put it close to the snow. So you could hear the wind whip the snow which sounds like that scraping sound and that's how we got that sound normally when you're recording you don't want to get wind sound it disrupts it it, it sounds awful but in this case i felt quite proud of myself that i could capture wind in such a way that it really communicated something that's awesome. And our next question seems like it's going to be a lot harder. So fair warning, Violet Rose Flores is wondering um, how many sounds you think you've recorded in your career so far? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I have recorded thousands, but to say how many of those sounds that I knew, knew who was making them? Probably only a handful, quite honestly. You know, I could tell elephants, I could tell birds, I could tell frogs. But when it came to insects, which are almost in every one of my recordings, I have no clue. I mean, there are, there are at least 900,000 species of insects in the world. So I have no clue. Uh, and even though I've been working with Laurel and her, uh, knowledge of Katie did sounds, I still am pretty clueless, to be quite honest with you. But I've recorded a lot. A year, in 30 years, you record a lot of stuff. I believe that. We've got Adele who is wondering if there's any sound bucket lists for either of you guys. Is there somewhere or something mm. that you want to record but haven't gotten to yet? 
Laurel? I, so one of the fun things about recording insects in Panama is that almost no one has ever recorded those species before. And so when we catch a katydid, we put it in front of a microphone and leave it overnight. And then the next morning, when you walk up and listen to the sounds and look at them, you become the first person to know what sound that animal makes. And so every single time that happens, it's a really special moment for me. Yeah, I, I would have to say my, my bucket list are those things I don't know what I'm, that I don't know, have not yet heard, quite frankly. I love to set up microphones and walk away and then come back hours later and listen and think, holy smokes, because I'm not there, these things are going wild. They're talking to each other. They're chasing each other. It's, uh, and, and it's just this whole process of discovery that really excites me and makes me want to learn more about them. Amazing. Well, let's take a question from an on-screen student. Let's go to Abby. Abby, go ahead and turn your microphone on and ask a question. Um, do you have a favorite recording that you've done? Mm. Wow. I think that I can, I can think of two. I can think of the slow down recording that you just heard of the forest. That was a recording actually that Laurel, uh, Laurel made and then I slowed it down. Well, Laurel and a bunch of people were made and I slowed it down and it revealed this world of sound that we normally don't hear because it's too high, right? It's in the ultrasonic, the bats and those insects are communicating at frequencies. The pitch is so high we can't hear it, but when we slow it down, we can. That's one of my all-time favorites. It's like suddenly I'm a world that I did not know exist has been opened up to me. And there are so many interesting things there that I just had no clue about. The other thing I really enjoyed traveling with the Tibetans. I, I went on a pilgrimage with the Tibetans. And I'll tell you, they are probably the Tibetans that I was with, and I think this is a can be a generalized statement. They are the most musical, sound-oriented people I know. They've got bells on everything. They're constantly singing when they walk. Their animals are make sounds that are just fill the air, and they just kind of live with it. And it's just those two experiences are probably my best. But it's really hard. I mean, the recording of the elephants was amazing. I mean, geez, I don't know. The fact that there are sounds out, there are things out there making sounds that are, have nothing to do with me is probably the most exciting thing. That they're just things that exist and communicate on their own for their own purposes. That's really exciting. So cool. And then Sophia is wondering, Laurel, what is your favorite insect and what kind of noise does it make? <laughs> That's like asking a parent what their favorite child is. That's a really <laughs> hard question. No, there are lots of great insects in the world. One of my favorites is a katydid that lives in North America. So if you go outside at night in the summer, you might hear an insect go, and it's just such a neat sound. And if you find the insect, the insect is maybe only that big. And so that would be one of my favorites. That's a pretty good one. Well, let's take our next question from Kid Conservationist. Go for it. Um, so I have a whole YouTube channel devoted to protecting my favorite animal, orangutans. Um, mm. What's your favorite animal and why is it your favorite animal? Have you seen it? Jeez. Or... <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, for me, every time I hear a new sound that an animal makes, that animal becomes my favorite, quite honestly. <laughs> and it becomes my favorite slowly you know i'm interested in the sound that it makes it's unusual so i go wow what is that so then i have to go to a scientist like laurel and say what in the world is going on here what is this why is this animal making this sound you know and and when i learn something about that animal it suddenly becomes my all-time favorite but then i'll hear some another new sound and that becomes my favorite animal um, so i i i am constantly surprised and delighted by a world that offers me so many different sounds and so many different animals that make those sounds, quite frankly. 
And speaking of all of those different sounds, we've got Ben who is nine years old and is wondering what the very strangest sound you've ever heard or recorded is. Wow. Mm. Well, Bill, I'd say, thinking, yeah, please go ahead, Laurel. I have to think about what, this. One of my favorites comes from people that I work with at Cornell who record sounds underwater and so I'm used to hearing whale sounds, but I'd never heard seal sounds before. But if you put a microphone under the ice in Antarctica, you hear <laughs> And it's these amazing seal sounds. So there's a lot of really neat sounds in the world. The first time I heard these, these uh, the recording of these seals that Laurel's describing, I thought a spaceship was landing, quite honestly. I mean, it sounded like it, it's so otherworldly. You can't believe that an animal's making that. A walrus, too. You know, walruses make a sound that sounds like two, two trash can lids being banged together. That's a walrus. He's making this sound. It sounds like two trash can lids. I mean, it's like there are so many unusual sounds and we know so little about what, how they make them. And we're kind of know what, why they're making them, but we're not so sure. And that's one of the great things about working with sound and working with sounds that animals make, because there's so much that isn't yet known. And so many sounds that have not yet been heard. It's a great area to work in. So cool. Let's go to Solbin for our next question. Solbin, go ahead and unmute your microphone and use a nice loud voice. Um, has anything gone wrong? <laughs> has, <laughs> has How many times? Not gone wrong? <laughs> There's the boring kind of wrong where your batteries go dead or you forget the right kind of microphone cable. There's also the interesting kind of going wrong where your pulley system breaks and your recorders fall 90 feet out of a tree. Ah, <laughs> uh, geez, things that go wrong. Um, yeah, showing up, uh, showing up and realizing, oh, I forgot my microphone <laughs> and having to run back or even worse. You got your microphone, you got your recorder. There's this animal that's making the most amazing sound in the world and you're recording it and you're just listening and you're thinking, this is like the most beautiful thing. No one has ever heard this. And you look down and you notice you're not recording at all. The machine's still in pause and the animal flies or disappears and you've lost it. Oh, oh, it's happened more than once. Don't tell anybody, okay? Heartbreaking. <laughs> well, we've got Rue Kendrick on YouTube who is wondering what the best way to start recording insects in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. is. Can you just use your iPhone? Is there something you'd recommend they use instead? Ah, Laurel, why don't you go ahead and I'll put yeah. up on the screen that... Yeah. Um, so if you have an iPhone, that actually works well for recording many types of insects. So you're not going to be able to record the things that are really, really high, but if you can hear it, you can probably record it. And so what Bill is getting is a link to a really cool um, phone app. So when you record sound, you can listen to it, but you can also see it. So in the same way that you can read music, you can see sound. So if it's you know, starting and sweeping up, like whoop, you'll, you can watch it on the screen of your phone, start and sweep up. Or if it's a cricket and it's making chirp, 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 you can see that in the image. And so there's a free app for phones. We don't have anything commercially to do with it, but it's called Spectrum View. And can you can walk around with it and hold it up to an insect, or you can hold it up and talk to it or you can listen when a plane goes over and see what those different types of sounds look like. And it's really fun. Uh, try whistling in particular. Can everyone see on, does everyone see on the screen? No. Yeah. All right, no, Bill, you're gonna have to push the little green button at the bottom one more time. For oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right, sorry. No, 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 no. You're right, 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 right. Uh, green button. 
Um, and if you go to one of the app providers and search for Spectrum, S-P-E-C-T-R-U-M, View, V-I-E-W, it has sort of a mm -hmm. swirly app inside, a, or a swirly um, icon inside a green and blue background. All right, here we go, folks. The uh, other cool thing you can try with it is making vowel sounds and consonants. So when you make vowels, you'll see lots of lines. It's one type of sound, but then when you make a consonant, that's a hard sound that produces lots of different pitches. And so you'll just see bars of energy. It's cool. Go go make a bunch of different sounds. It's fun. I love it. And we've got links to that in the family guide, which will be linked in the description of this video in just a second. So you awesome. fine folks can find it there too. Brilliant. Okay, good. All right. And let's jump to William and Lily for a question. Nice loud voice for us. Uh, have you any? Have you ever recorded like any big cat sounds, like tigers or cougars? Um, no. <laughs> I have to tell you the truth. Uh, no, I was in Nepal um, when we were doing the story on uh, the rhino relocation. The, the um, and actually there was a, an incident with a tiger and I, and I ended up going out with um, the parks crew hunting for the tiger, which of course we had to go out on elephants because uh, tigers are dangerous animals. But I, we never found it and we never even saw it. So no, no, no tigers for me. No lions. I have had a bear though. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> in that case, <laughs> but I'm bummed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I don't make a terrible joke, you know, it's not a real <laughs> Rita Martinez is wondering if moths or butterflies make any noises, Laurel. Oh, that's a really fun question. So, if you'd asked people 50 years ago, they probably would have said no, and many of them don't. But there are some moths that, when they fly, they go click, 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 click. And some people think that it might be a way of jamming the echolocation calls of bats because bats are sending out these clicks of sound, but then they're also hearing these extra clicks. And so it's hard to understand what's going on. And so it's hard for them to catch them off. So it's a really cool example. So smart, love that. And let's go to Sahar for a question. Go ahead and turn on your microphone and ask nice and loud for us. Um, the black bear see you. Did the bear just? Yeah, the black. It, it was a. It was a bear in Nepal. Um, yeah, he saw us, but he, and he was so frightened. <laughs> it was. It was terrible. We we're out moving through the brush, and uh, we kind of stumbled across to, upon him. Right, and he looked at us, gave this loud snort, <sighs> and ran as fast as he could. Love that. <laughs> Well, uh, Bill and Laurel, as you know, explorers appreciate and respect diversity in the human and natural world. They understand that every person, every voice is vital to the survival of the whole. And they recognize that they're only as powerful and as whole and as healthy as the rest of their community. So how do you folks as sound-based explorers make a positive impact and, and lift voices in your communities? Laurel, I can answer too. To me, that's one of the amazing powers of sound is it's both personal and also transmissible. So you can talk to lots and lots of people as if it were just the two of you together in a room. So that's one of the things that's always touched me about Bill's radio stories is it feels like it's just you and the people in the field doing this thing. And yet millions of people are sharing this experience at the same time. So it's a really powerful medium for connecting people. Um, and sharing information. And uh, if we think of, if, if think about this for a moment, and that is that almost every animal in the world uses sound in some way. Uh, certainly all vertebrates, you know, animals with backbones, they all use sound. They may not all see. There, there are fish that live in caves that don't see, but they all hear. And it's something that we all share. And it's something for us to be aware of because sometimes we humans forget that other animals need to listen to one another, right? And we make so much noise that it's very difficult for them to hear one another. So we talk about air pollution a lot. 
we often have to think, I think we need to think about noise pollution as well, because so many of the world's animals depend on sound in order to live. And that's something that we share with them. Sound is important to us and it is important to most, almost every other animal on the planet. Amazing. And do you folks have any general advice for all the young explorers joining in today? Uh, well, I tell you, I would say if you, if there's something that really interests you and it's something you think about quite often, that's what you should pursue. I'll tell you, I started off not knowing what I was going to do in life. And I always gravitated towards sound. And I just followed that. I had no idea where it would lead me, whether it would provide me a way of making a living who it, it, it would introduce me to, but I'll tell you, by following that, the whole world has opened up to me, and I've met some amazing people and amazing creatures along the way. And so if there's something that moves you, if it's sound, if it's, a, if it's what you see, if it's what you touch, if it's what you take, whatever that experience is, go for it and enjoy it. And, and life will open up for you in ways that will make it just a wonderful experience. Such cool advice. Anything to add, Laurel? That's hard to follow. I think I would say, you know, for me, one of the things that I've learned doing science through the years is just how long it takes to do something that I find important and how many times you have to try it and try it again. You know, I remember not that many years ago, the first time that I went to Panama and caught you know, all these different insects. And I didn't know what any of them were. And it took so long the first few times just to identify it and know what's, what kind of insect it was. And then to slowly learn the sound of that insect. And But just day after day, you keep doing this. And all of a sudden, you realize that you can walk into this forest and any Katie did that you find, you're going to know what it is and what sound it makes and what it eats and what eats it. And so it just was a slow process, but if you keep working at it, it actually, eventually you look back and realize how much you've learned and done. So cool. Well, thank you both. And for everyone out there at home, you can check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Be, sure be sure to share your work with us on Twitter. And we hope to see you at our upcoming events. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., we have photographer Amy Vitale joining us to introduce us to her friends at Olpegida, including two of the last Northern white rhinos on earth. And at 2 p.m. tomorrow, we're going to learn all about King Tut's treasures with National Geographic's archaeologist in residence, Fred Hebert. Uh, but for now, we've been listening so well. It's time for us to finally get loud. Before we sign off, I'm going to turn on everybody's microphones. Go ahead and help me out. Get those microphones on. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Laurel and Bill. Bye. 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 Thank Talking you. Talking with you all. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>